California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invite you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice. Danger is my stock and trade. If you find yourself way out on the limb and don't know how to get off, you got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, if ever a man needed help, I do. There is a matter that involves not only millions of dollars, but several million people in a country I'm not at liberty to name. Believe me, I call on you only after a great deal of thought. What I know is just too much responsibility for one man to carry. I feel if anyone can help me... It would be a man like you... And it's signed, Martin Kirsch, President, Bonded Paper Corporation. Well, weren't you listening, George? Mm-hmm. Matter that involves millions of dollars, millions of people, a country I'm not at liberty to name. Doesn't that get a rise out of you? Well, Angel, I'm trying to suppose I'm the head of a paper company. I make paper for water cups, greeting cards, confetti, brown paper to wrap bologna. I doubt if any of that covers Mr. Kirsch's problem, whatever it is. Now, just what kind of paper would cause a sedately hysterical letter like this one? Your hat, Mr. Valentine. <laughs> Brooks, see, if I didn't have you to read my mind, I wouldn't know where I was going next. The Bonded Paper Corporation. I imagine you're more observant than most people, Mr. Valentine. Oh, uh, well, Mr. Kirsch? On the way in, you probably noticed several men watching you and Miss Brooks very carefully. Yeah, I couldn't help it. I could feel their eyes boring into the back of my neck. Police, Mr. Kirsch? No, Miss Brooks. My own private guards. Oh, now, wait a minute. You've got me winging here. I can understand the precautions if this were a bank or a mint. It's a little of both. But maybe I'd better explain. Yes, I wish you would. This isn't just a paper mill, Mr. Valentine. Ours is a very special organization, one of the very few of its kind in the world. Oh? My family established it more than a hundred years ago. The paper we turn out here is used for bonds, stock certificates, negotiable securities, even money for certain foreign countries. Oh, well, now I see what you mean by a combination bank and mint. It's a tedious and very scientific process to make paper so individual that it can't be duplicated by anyone else. Each one of our clients gets his own particular type of paper with characteristic watermarks and secret composition. Well, I knew the government went to all that trouble, Mr. Kirsch. We do the same thing, only on a private basis. Which brings us to what? Two reams of paper which can destroy the financial system of an entire country. What? See, Miss Brooks, an expert engraver can make plates that will produce counterfeit money almost impossible to detect. What they can't do is duplicate the paper. And despite the guards, two reams of this paper are missing, is that right? Yes. The first time in the history of our firm. Just how did it happen, Mr. Kirsch? That's what baffles us all. All the men here are craftsmen in their field. They've been carefully investigated, and they've been with us for years. I see. One day last week, a fire broke out in the loft building next to us. The Estrelita Candy Company, naturally, there was quite a bit of commotion. Firemen running in and out of here to get on the roof next door. Anyway... At the end of the day, when we took inventory, which we always do, these two reams of paper were gone. Stolen. Uh Uh-huh. Well, that doesn't give me very much to work on, Mr. Kirsch. Anyone posing as a fireman could have been in and out of here that day without being noticed. I know. But still, that paper must be found at any cost and with the utmost secrecy. Well, what was the paper to be used for? Money, Miss Brooks. Actually, I can't reveal the name of the country. But consider this. Two reams of paper, 1,000 sheets, on which can be printed currency of any denomination. Millions in currency indistinguishable from the money that's already in circulation. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. All that lucre suddenly dumped into a country could start one whale of a panic. The mere rumor of this paper being stolen could cause wild speculation. That's why I thought it would be best to deal with one individual like yourself. Oh, I'm flattered. The thing to remember, Mr. Valentine, is that time is of the essence. Whoever stole that paper either has the plates already made or is working on them now. Well, at the moment, I don't even know where to start, Mr. Kirsch, but uh, I'll do my best. But, Lieutenant... 
Lieutenant Riley. Believe me, Lieutenant, I'd tell you more about this deal if I could. Well... Please, Lieutenant, play ball. Look, I, I'm not holding out just out of loyalty to a client. This is something big. Valentine, if you talk me into a deal that's going to blow up in my face, I I'll... I promise you it won't. Uh, okay. The guy you'll need to work with you is Jigger Collins. Okay. And you think he knows all there is to know about forges and counterfeiters? <laughs> Listen, when it comes to hot money, this guy is an encyclopedia. Why, we got enough on him right now to send him back to jail. Then why is he running around loose, Lieutenant? He isn't. We know where he is and what he's doing every minute. Oh. You see, Miss Brooks, we have to have our sources of information. And Jigger knows that if he doesn't give us the right dope when we want it, we'll slap him right back in the can. Well, thanks a lot for this, Lieutenant. Well, here. I'll give you his address. It's a rooming house, Forsyth Street, number 76. Okay, got it. Maybe I'm getting feeble-minded, but uh, I'll tell you what I'll do. What's that? I'll talk to Jigger. I'll even tell him I'll take the finger off him if he plays ball with you all the way. Maybe that'll help. You know you can be awfully sweet sometimes, Lieutenant. Oh, oh, oh. I'm just trying to... <clears throat> uh, look, Valentine, if this case of yours is so all-fire important, why don't you get going? <laughs> Here, here. I spoke to the lieutenant, Mr. Valentine. Yeah, chicken. Yeah. Don't worry about me cooperating. I was waiting for a chance like this. I'll do anything to get those boys off my tail. Well, this is your chance, right? Okay, okay. Now, let me get this straight. Now, Valentine, you want to know who I'd think of first if you was talking about a big counterfeiting job? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, Fred Biglow. Just like that. He makes the best place in the business. Why, that guy... Hey, wait a minute. What is it? Bigelow's in town right now. Huh? I was wondering why. He ain't been around for years. Well, well, well. It might be just the lead we're looking for. Well, you've got to start somewhere, George. Chigger, you're going to introduce me to Bigelow. Huh? Are you not... Yeah, you're going to say I'm fresh out of jail. I'm in town looking for a connection. Yes, but who are you supposed to be? Maybe you can answer that, Chigger. Me? Who do you know just got out of stir? Somebody who wouldn't be in town right now. Somebody Bigelow wouldn't know. Uh-uh, friend. You're playing with dynamite. Fred Bigelow is tough. He makes it a point to know things. Now, for instance, he'd know every ex-con I know. He'd spot you as a phony in no time. Oh, darling, I don't like this setup. You never did anything like this before. Hey, now, look, certainly, Jigger, I can pass for somebody Bigelow would take to his bosom, if I'm a good enough actor. Come on, I'll think hard. Yeah, I am. Want a cigarette? Oh, thanks, I don't smoke. I... Hey, wait. Huh? Yeah. I did a rap back east with a guy named Art Saunders. Go on, go on. And the poor jerk didn't come out. He didn't have no friends, no relatives, no nothing. You could be him. Nobody knows or cares if he's dead. You think fast, Jigger. Too bad you didn't decide to play it straight. You might have done pretty well for yourself instead of being jungled up in this worm-eaten rooming house. Oh, well, I guess it's just the early environments. Done it. That's what the psychologist in the jail always tells me. But are you sure you know enough about Art Saunders, Jigger? Bigelow would check, you know. I know everything about Art Lady. And what you don't know, I'll pick up at headquarters by teletype. I don't know. Even if I get you to see Bigelow, Mr. Valentine, you're going to have to walk light. Like I said, he he don't take in so easy. And like I also said, he's a tough baby. Yeah, well, you just arrange for me to meet him. Yeah, but I don't know exactly where he lives. But I know he operates from the, the Claremont Hotel. You got my number. Call me up when you get it set. Well, let's go, Brooksy. Okay. You can brief me on Saunders later, Chigger. Okay, Mr. Valentine. Oh, George, you're taking a terrible chance. Hold it, Angel, and listen to this carefully. Brooksy, you're as important in this deal as I am. If I line up with Bigelow, it's going to be a long time before he trusts me. Yeah. From now on, you and I don't even know each other. George. You're my only contact. If there's anything important, we'll leave a message for each other first with Chigger. If that doesn't work, we can trust Paul behind the cigar stand downstairs in our building. Yeah. And then there's Marcus, the bootblack. You got it straight? Mm-hmm. But, George, how do you know a stool pigeon like Jigger won't call up Bigelow and tell him who you are? I don't know. But then they don't might... Don't worry, Angel. You'll see me around. A guy'd be a fool not to come back to something like you. Hmm, George. I'll promise you one thing, Brooksy. When I meet Bigelow, I'll be as much like the late Art Saunders as anybody can. Hey, 
figure tell me all about you, Saunders. Said I might find some use for you. Well, you know how it is, Mr. Piccolo. You get out in the free and you want to make some connections. Oh, sure, sure. Saunders, meet a couple of the boys. I, uh, how do you do? Hi. Ask him what he does so good we can use him. I'll get to that, you baldo. Well, I can handle myself pretty good. I don't dress too bad, and I can push queer money in the best of circles. That sort of makes me your kind of guy, don't it? Look, Mr. Bigelow, you said this was going to be a big deal, and not too many people in it. All right, Eddie, all right. Yes, Saunders, I heard about the rough deal you got back there at Joliet. Joliet? Yeah. <laughs> you got it wrong, Bigelow. I spent my time in Fredericksburg. Oh, yes. Guess I got it wrong. Well, I don't know, Saunders. Perez here, I mean your baldo, handles the rug pretty well. Not that we ever need it, of course. Of course not. And Eddie's pretty fancy with his fists. Eddie, why don't you show Saunders what I mean? Hey, what is this? I'll show you what he means. You'll never do it that way, man. Let go. When you swing like that, you might lose an arm. He's breaking my arm. Stop him. Stay out of this, you baldo. What do you say, big Let him go. Oh, my God. Now, what do you say we stop kidding, big low? Have I passed all your tests? Tests? Yeah, you tried to trip me up about the jail I was in. You had Eddie throw a punch at me to see if I reacted right. You checked and found out that nobody can do that to me without ending up with a broken arm. You satisfied I'm Saunders? I think so. Say, uh, how do you get a hold of a guy's arm like that? I'll show you sometime, Eddie. No, never mind. Okay. When do I begin to work, Piccolo? As of now. But we'll talk about it later. Meanwhile, move your stuff into Eddie's room. It's down on the fourth floor. Come on, I'll show you. Thanks, Piccolo. Thanks a lot. Piccolo, why do we need him? This is no strong arm, Jack. Oh, we need him very much, you baldo. Why do you think I tested him? Made him feel we're convinced he's Art Saunders. Well, is he not? No. You see, I know Art Saunders is dead. <laughs> Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about smoother driving. If you've picked August for your motoring vacation, here's a suggestion for making your trip more pleasant. Get a chassis lubrication tomorrow at an independent Chevron gas station or standard station. Here they have more than a dozen different RPM oils and greases. Each one is tailor-made to save wear on parts, to seal out grit, dust, and moisture to eliminate noise and give you smoother, cushioned riding. And at any of these stations, a thorough grease job is also a clean job. No smudges or smears to worry about. So for happier riding and real economy, get a chassis lube tomorrow at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station where they say and mean, we'll take better care of your car. <laughs> Now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine with George facing this situation. You're on the trail of two reams of paper, 1,000 sheets. Not important? Yes, but a foreign country happens to print its currency on this particular kind of paper. You find out that a tight little gang of counterfeiters is working on a big job. You worm your way in. You don't know it, but they've got your tab for a phony. Fortunately, the hulk of the man whose hotel room you share doesn't know that you're not Art Saunders. Yet. Let's have that again, Art. Oh, no, no, not Let's again. See, I, uh, I throw a right cross at you. Before I know it, I get my arm pinned up in back of me like this, huh? Yeah, that's right, that's right. You got it down, Pat. Nice room you got here, Eddie. Yeah, I like it. But the boss really lives in class. Yeah, I bet. He's got a penthouse at the Park Lane. Must be doing all right, huh? Say, uh, Eddie. Huh? What's this big job everybody's so hepped up about? All I know is I got a soft spot here. I'm trying to be good to myself and clam up. Now, about this arm trick. Suppose a guy comes at you with a left. Wait a minute. Yeah? Hey, that's me. What's that? Oh, you don't say. 
Sure, I'll take care of that little thing. That's my specialty. But what about... Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, boss. Every minute. Yeah. What is it, Eddie? Something for us to do? No, Saunders, just something for me to do. Oh, wait a minute now. Bigelow didn't put me on the payroll just to hang around like this. How about me coming along just for the ride? No, you stay here. But when I come back, I'll be with you every minute. That's a promise. Brooks, you say Valentine didn't leave word for you in any of those places he told you? No, and I'm beginning to get worried, Lieutenant. I'll tell you what you do. Try Jigger Collins again. If there's still nothing, then we'll decide what to do next. Yes, please. You live in number 76, don't you? Yeah, before this fire, I was the janitor. Well, have you seen Mr. Collins? No, and I ain't likely to. What do you mean? It was his room where the fire started, the poor man. What are you talking about? He was dead before anybody could get to him. The fire marshal said he must have fallen asleep with a lighted cigarette. Plain carelessness. But, but that couldn't have been it. Mr. Collins didn't smoke cigarettes, I know. Maybe it was a cigar, then. But the way it ended was the same. The poor man. I went all through the files, Miss Brooks, when Lieutenant Riley called down here to the record room. Yes, Sergeant, what'd you find? Well, as far as we can tell, only this man here is connected with Piccolo for any length of time. Huh? Well, let me see. Turner, Edward. Yeah, worst kind of a rat. Age 36, 1938 suspicion of arson, 1943 arson conviction, two years Folsom, 1946... That's his racket, Miss Brooks. Turner sets fire so nobody knows how they started. You know, for insurance and other reasons. Fire. That loft building. And now Jigger Collins. Huh? Then Bigelow must know about George. Well, I don't get your meaning, Mr. Oh, I've got to find a way to warn him. Paul, are you sure Mr. Valentine didn't leave some kind of message here at the cigar stand? I surely would have remembered if Miss Brooks. Say, where's he been keeping himself anyway? Funny you ask me that, Miss Brooks. What do you mean, Marcus? Well, I was shining Mr. Valentine's shoes. Yeah? He kind of felt he wanted to say something to me, but there was a big heavyset man with him, so he didn't say nothing. Well, go on, Marcus. Of course, I didn't call Mr. Valentine by his name, just like he told me, so nobody said nothing. Well, when did they leave? Couldn't have been more than 15 minutes ago. You know, Eddie, I like you. But there are times when a guy likes to be alone. I like you too, Saunders. I just want to be around in case you get into any trouble. Yeah. Come on, let's get upstairs to the room. Hey, incidentally, Eddie, what was the job Bigelow sent you on today? Oh, nothing much. Just gave a guy a hot foot all over. Huh? Oops! Oh! Oh, I'm sorry. I guess I wasn't looking where I was going. Oh, that's all right, miss. No harm done. <laughs> oh, it was so clumsy. Oh, here, wait a minute. You dropped your pocketbook. Oh, thank you very much. Let's get going. Mm-hmm. Nice dish. Hey, Eddie, I could swear I saw her somewhere before. Skip it, Romeo. Let's get upstairs. <laughs> As I said before, Eddie, a uh, fellow likes a little privacy sometimes. Let's not go through that again. Well, it looks as though this is the only way I'm going to get it. <laughs> it <won't... laughs> uh, that ought to hold you till I get you tied up. Come on now. Over with you, big boy. To get out of this, you'll have to be a Houdini. Uh, uh, well. 
Now, let's see what we can find. Uh, here we're... What are you doing? Just giving you the once over lightly, Eddie. Yeah. See what I can find that's interesting. Yeah. Who wised you up that we're on to you? Oh, just somebody I bumped into. Yeah. The bim down in the lobby, eh? Yeah? That's what. Since when do you use foreign money? What is it to you? A whole lot. And a very fancy bit of currency. President of the Republic right in the middle, flanked by the whole cabinet, medals and all. Manuel Flores, Juan Aguinaldo, Obaldo Perez, Ramon Cordova, and company. Okay, Eddie, start talking. <laughs> you haven't forgotten Saunders' favorite persuader. Hey, wait. Only this time I'll break your arm. The stakes are that high. Take your hands off this me. This is a little souvenir you picked up, isn't it? Isn't this the money Bigelow is printing on that stolen paper? Eddie, don't force me to... Yeah, 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 that's the stuff. Oh, where is he making it? Come on, talk. In the, the basement of the building next to the paper company. You mean that's for Ada Candy Company? Where the fire was? Bigelow thought it would be as safe as place. Hey, Moses, now it gels. Bigelow had that fire started. That's how he heisted the paper. Hello, operator. Let me have police headquarters. <laughs> Couldn't wait till you got here, Valentine. Oh, Donnie, it's so good to see you. I was so afraid that gorilla with you saw me slip you that nose. Say, what about Bigelow and the others, Lieutenant? Well, this is just how we found the place. Empty. Ah, oh, you can't say they didn't work fast once they found out about me. Oh, I call Mark and Kerr. She'll be over here in a minute. This isn't going to make him very happy. Miss Brooks told me what this deal is all about, so I put out a general alarm for Bigelow. Yeah, he won't waste a minute trying to get out of the country with all that money. What was that in your note about Collins, Brooksy? Well, he's dead, George. There was a fire in his rooming house. He was murdered. It was Eddie Turner at his best. So that's what he meant, the hot foot all over. Lieutenant Turner is all bundled up waiting for you at the hotel. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Send the car over to the Claremont. Bring Eddie Turner in. Well, you did a good job on this case, Valentine. You got a tough break, but don't worry about Bigelow. We'll pick him up sooner or later. I wasn't particularly thinking of Bigelow. What do you yeah. mean, George? Good work, Valentine. I understand you traced the paper to the men who stole it. Yeah, Mr. Kirsch. And to think it was right here, next door, all the time. I'm Lieutenant Riley, Mr. Kirsch. There's just one hitch. Hitch? Yes, take a look at these uh, strips of paper here next to the press. Yes. Yes, that's our paper, all right. That's all that's left of the two reams, Mr. Kirsch. You mean they already printed the money? They have it with them, wherever they are. I, I'd better sit down. I'm afraid we won't have time for that. Well, meaning what? I gathered from Eddie Turner that the boss lived at the park lane. You don't think he's still there, do you? We'll see when we get there, Brooksy. But I think you'd better come along with us, Mr. Kirsch. Oh, uh, there's only one penthouse here at the park lane, isn't it? Uh, uh, that's right, sir. Thanks. That's all I wanted to know. Uh, uh, who shall I say is calling? I really must announce. Relax, it. friends. Relax. This is the police, and you can let me have the pass key. Really, Valentine, I wish you'd tell us why you brought us here at all. I don't understand it. It won't do any good now. Well, we can't just give up, Mister Kirsch. Here we are. Huh? What was it? Hey. Oh, that... That was a shot. Nice guess, Mr. Kirsch. Miss Brooks, you better stay back with Mr. Kirsch. Well, knocked himself off, whoever he is. Yeah. Did a good job of it, too. Who is he, Valentine? Do you know him? His name's Obaldo. Uh, who? Obaldo Perez. How do you know who he is, George? Look, the money. Scattered all over the desk. That's the stuff Bigelow turned out. What in the name of heaven is this? Those half-packed bags should speak for themselves, Lieutenant. Well, this, this Perez, where does he fit in? Eddie Turner said the boss lived here at the park lane. Huh? Well, you're looking at him right now. But Bigelow was... Here, a... take a look at one of these bills. Thank goodness they're here. When I think what would have happened here... Uh, just a minute, Mr. Kirsch. Uh, what about this bill, Valentine? Lieutenant, there in the center of the picture is the President of the Republic. Yeah. With all the members of his cabinet. Now, take a good look at the third man from the left, the Secretary of War. Yeah, let me see it. That would be General Ubaldo Perez, the boss. George, 
gorgeous. Oh, Perez was such a little man to have such a big, fantastic scheme. Well, Napoleon was a little man, Angel. And Hitler was no giant. Yeah, but I still don't quite understand how he expected to pull it off. Well, it's not as complicated as it sounds. Perez was an exile for being overambitious. If his country were suddenly flooded with all this new money, well, there was bound to be a panic. In all the confusion, Ubaldo and his followers planned to step into power. Oh. You know, George, I almost wish the clerk hadn't called up and announced us. I would have loved to meet a fabulous character like that. <laughs> Don't be romantic, Brooksy. He was cornered and he made the grand gesture, that's all. Hmm. Oh, yes, darling, I spoke to Mr. Kirsch. Huh? He promised to make a very special kind of paper for my wedding invitations when I get married. The kind of paper nobody could possibly reproduce. <laughs> You don't say. Oh, he's so grateful to us. He promised to work in all kinds of tricky watermarks, Cupid's arrows, lover's knots, things like that. That's right. Doesn't that thrill you? Yeah. <laughs> It'd thrill me more if he gave you two reams of paper they print negotiable bonds on. Oh, you're mercenary. Oh, oh, I wouldn't make a pig of myself, Angel. I wouldn't turn out a single bond after I reached a nice round billion dollars. <laughs> Do you know why marching soldiers break step when crossing a bridge? To counteract the weight and force that comes from marching in rhythm. Atlas Tire engineers use the same principle to give you quiet running tires. By changing the frequency of brakes in the tread, they got rid of the hum. And quieter, smoother riding comfort is only one of the advantages you get with Atlas Tires. Seventy to eighty different compounds go into an Atlas Tire for improved heat resistance, more mileage. Its deeper grooves and non-skid edges give you greater safety, too. Quick, straight stops, and it's a tire that sits right down on the turns. Also, with Atlas Passenger Tires, you get a written warranty. A warrant that's good at 38,000 Atlas dealers seven days a week. So, to give yourself safer driving with more comfort and more mileage, get grip-safe Atlas Tires. Get them at your standard station or independent Chevron gas station, where they say, and mean... We'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... Hello, George. Yeah, Brooksy. Well, I've only a minute to talk. I made an excuse to get away from Eric for just a moment. Yeah, go on. Eric just told me he gets $1,250 every month. The exact amount Dr. Penford draws out of the bank. Yes, but... Well, why would a son be blackmailing his own father? If I can find out the answer to that, Angel, I'll know who wrote that note to Dr. Penford. And maybe prevent a murder. Adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and Standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Herbert Butterfield as Martin Kirsch, Joe Forte as Big Low, Eddie Fields as Ubaldo, Clayton Post as Eddie, and Charlie Lung as Jigger. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter, your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System.